I've, I've said that if I could pick one Disney character to have as like my life mentor, it would be uh-huh. the grandma from Moana. Um, <laughs> Jen aspires to be the village crazy lady. <laughs> I, do. I, I already am in a, in a lot of people's eyes. I might as well just embrace it. Get, to, get the, uh, the tattoo on my back. Right. <laughs> Hi, this is Danae. I'm the founder of Simple Families. Simple Families is an online community for parents who are seeking a simpler, more intentional life. In this show, we focus on minimalism with kids, positive parenting, family wellness, and decreasing the mental load. My perspectives are based in my firsthand experience raising kids, but also rooted in my PhD in child development. So you're going to hear conversations that are based in research, but more importantly, real life. Thanks for joining us. Hi there. Thanks so much for tuning in. Those voices you heard in the intro were Jen and Lauren. They are best friends and hosts of the podcast, Magical Mindset Moments. In their podcast each week, they do a deep dive on some of their favorite and not so favorite moments from Disney movies. In particular, looking at the life lessons that the stories have to offer us. Even though I'm not the biggest fan of Disney, I really enjoyed my chat with Jen and Lauren, and I learned so much. Their wisdom is absolutely helping me take a deeper look into what these stories have to offer for us and our kids. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoy this chat. Hi, Jen and Lauren. How are you? Doing so well. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. I am glad that you're here. So I have a funny story to start with, actually, that kind of inspired me to talk with you all today. Um, was when my daughter was four, she did something, and I don't even remember what she did, but it was something, quote unquote, naughty, and something she knew that I didn't want her to do. And she looked at me and said, the spirit of my dead grandmother told me to do it. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Okay, oh, she, I, she is my favorite right? now. <laughs> and I just froze and I was like, excuse me? And I kind of panicked. I'm like, so now we're talking to to, to spirits. Um, but then I shared it with a friend and she's like, oh, like in Pocahontas or in Moana. And I was like, oh, now it makes sense. And it just got me thinking about how you know these stories really touch our kids. And we don't, I never thought a second thought about you know, grandmother Willow or, you know, whatever the grandmother of Moana's named is, but you guys are experts at, at piecing this apart. So <laughs> we are, we, we did that to each other. <laughs> we would for many years now, we would be calling in Harry Potter or different Disney stories to just try to like it. I, I think that the best benefit that story has for us is it helps us see ourselves like it helps with compassion right because we're like oh we're not alone like that's happening in this story so lauren and i have been doing that with each other like since the beginning yes (laughs) friendship (laughs) the way we roll Tell, tell me a little bit about yourselves yeah tell me how did you meet who are you a little bit about your history well, um, we're both entrepreneurs uh, in the online space. So um, that's, I think, kind of a little uh, unique connection there. You know, it's a it can be a lonely world when you're making podcasts and, you know, creating courses or communities and you feel a little cut off. So we actually joined a mastermind that was hosted by a friend of ours and that's where we met through him. Mm. So we connected and uh, very quickly we're like, oh, I see you. <laughs> you are you are one of mine. I will be taking you with me for the rest of my life. So that's how it that's how it started. And then, you know, naturally those conversations for us Disney gals would turn towards those those stories. And Jen had a family. I did not when we met. And so she's been just an amazing guiding light for me in my life on many, many levels. I feel like Lauren and I bonded, you know, when you're in a crisis, like a business crisis, thankfully it was a business crisis, not a life (laughs) crisis at the time, though we've been through many of those now together, but I was having a business crisis and I was like, well, I'm just going to get real here right from the start. (laughs) And it it luckily never made, you know how sometimes you have your guard up and you're like trying to put on your face, your best face. I couldn't do that with Lauren from the very beginning and it ended up being like the best gift 
because our friendship has been so real and just like we don't have any pretenses we just are real with each other and then we were like hey it's kind of good to be this way with everyone all the time so yeah. that's what we thought about starting this together to invite people into that kind of dynamic was disney your focus before this podcast <laughs> No, no, <laughs> no. <Nope. laughs> I was in test prep. I helped kids get ready for the ACT and SAT. I've since sold that company. And now I help entrepreneurs, fellow digital entrepreneurs. But I have been since 2002, a yoga and mindfulness teacher. Um, I did that in a brick and mortar yoga studio that my husband and I owned from 2002 to 2010. And then by just demand as I had a daughter and my life got crazy. And I, my, I closed the studio and my students were like, you know, there's like this online thing now, which at the time I wasn't even reading blogs or anything in 2010. And they said, I think you could find a way to have some of it happening still online. And I've just been figuring it out online ever since then. And of course, when the pandemic hit, I was like, wow, that was really fortunate that I have been teaching yoga and mindfulness online for this long. So I still do that. That's still mm. my main thing. But so often I, as I'm teaching mindfulness skills or stuff to adults, primarily women in my community, I hear over and over and over. I wish I had learned this when I was a kid. I wish I had been having these conversations because of course it's having to rewire your brain after decades of doing it. So I just kept saying to Lauren, like, I think people want to have these conversations with their kids and they just don't know how. So that was where we came into this idea that story could be a way into these conversations in our families and our homes. Mm -hmm. I love that. I actually, I, when I remember when I was nine, I learned some mindfulness tools. I was in a gifted program and there was a component of that that they taught gifted kids mindfulness, thinking that they might need it in the future. Um, and I used that, those tools, when I learned when I was nine years old, I, the rest of my life, really, I guess, until I was an yeah. adult and I got trained in something else. But I mean, my, and they stuck with me. So you think sometimes that we teach kids these things when they're young and they don't stick, but I think we're really planting seeds that can grow and stick. I love that. <laughs> yes. yes. The official name of our business is Seeds of the Story because oh, I love that. that's exactly what we wanted. It was like to plant those seeds. If they don't, if it doesn't mean the same to them now that it means to yeah. us, who cares? We're beginning a conversation. It isn't like one and done with any of this. No, yeah. never. Yeah. And I think something that is becoming more and more common, I know they're doing this at my son's school, is that the psych the psychology department is integrating into the literature department so that they can talk about the themes in the characters and the stories. And it's such a beautiful way of kind of externalizing and distancing themselves from these topics that can feel a little bit scary when they're talking about their personal experiences. They can talk about them in a way that is much more approachable. Gosh, I love that so much. That's amazing. Yeah. How old yeah. is your son? What grade are they he doing? He is that eight. In? He's oh. in third grade. They're doing it in third grade. So that's fantastic. Yeah. And I'm hoping that'll be more and more. I'm hearing more of more schools that are moving towards a model like that where they're integrating literature and the psychological support services because there's so much opportunity there. And that's really what I feel like you guys do in your podcast. No? Yep. That's exactly what we're trying to do. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> we're figuring that, of course, we want the conversations to happen everywhere kids are with lots yeah. of different adults in their lives. But another thing Lauren and I talk about all the time is like, when do you find the time to do all of the, the list of things to do is so long. And we know families are watching movies together yeah. and kids are watching movies. So we thought, what if we helped them kind of get something else out of that time? Yeah. Out of the thing they're already doing, you know, and also I think too, that the idea that the investment of time here isn't just serving the kids, right? Like this work that we're doing on ourselves, obviously we have to say it in a different way to a child and depending on who that child is and age, you know, appropriate um, messaging. But if we do the work for ourselves, using these movies that our kids already love and then open the door to have those conversations with our kids, not only does it impact our immediate family, 
it also has this ripple effect to our communities. And the more we can have these conversations and put it on the table, right? I think often it, it means kind of like dishing up dinner, right? <laughs> you put mm -hmm. a lot of stuff out there. Maybe everybody doesn't take a bite of everything, <laughs> right. but you, your kids are going to, you're going to start to see who they are. You're going to start to, to see what resonates with them, where they are right now and what they, where they need to lean in and have more conversation or, you know, how you can pivot it. So I think laying, laying this, this strong foundation is just so critical and really having it be that relationship, right? Really having it be that ebb and flow, that back and forth is, is important, yeah. but we have to open the door. Right. I feel like when Encanto came out this year, that was the first Disney movie that I recall there being some real conversation around the, the underlying themes. I don't really remember that, you know, with well, I was really young when the little mermaid came out, but I mean, they were just movies and now we're really looking deeper into them. Is that in my, even frozen, like, I don't really call there, recall there being a lot of discussion around the underlying themes there. Is this, do you feel like a, a new movement within Disney to have more things woven in, or we just haven't seen it before? I think it's being called out in a more, um, bold way. I would mm -hmm. say, I think, you know, we're all learning more. I think post pandemic in particular, you know, we've all had to do work on ourselves. And so I think it's, it's a part, partly Disney's becoming more overt, um, and Pixar, but I think those themes have already always run deep. I mean, we've gone back to like Mary Poppins. There's a lot there. Um, it's a little more subtle, right? It's a reflection of the time, but I think we are in a time where we're having more open conversations. So we're starting to see that mirrored in the movies that are coming out. But, uh, I mean, there's, there's a lot in some of the older stories as well, especially the ones that resonate with us, right? The ones mm -hmm. that, the classics that we've taken along. Yeah, I agree. I think one of the interesting things that's shifting and maybe what you're seeing more of is that we're trying so hard to change the meaning we're making with things, I think. I, I just think there's a shift happening in our world and hopefully for the better, that we're seeing, it's not just the stuff that happens, it's not just the stories we watch, but it's the meaning we assign to them. And it feels mm -hmm. like a conversation about the meaning we're assigning to things is happening now that I haven't seen, I'm 45, that I haven't seen happening my entire life, probably yeah. not even much before the pandemic, where there was a clear understanding that we can connect to each other or disconnect from each other, not just based on the events, not just based on the story, not based on what's happening, but on the meaning we're assigning to what's happening. Yeah. And I feel like that's a real way that the conversation is shifting. And honestly, a powerful and important way that the conversation is shifting because it's so much about so, so little about what's actually happening and so much about the story we're telling ourselves about the story. Right. So much. I practice something called sand play or sand tray therapy in my therapy practice with kids. And part of that is I have these little figurines, representations of many different things across the world. And I have the Moana figurines and I have the Encanto figurines. I don't have all of them, but I have those. And when I explain to parents what this looks like is that, you know, each of these figurines have a different meaning to each of us. And Maui is one that I use a lot. You know, I'm like, especially for dads who seem to have a, a bit of a harder time wrapping their heads around this. And I'm like, you know, maybe when they create a scene, cause they, they take the different pieces and create a scene in the sandbox, you know, if they choose Maui it to represent you, perhaps we could interpret that as them thinking, you know, that you're a hero and you're a demigod, or maybe you could interpret that as them thinking that you're pompous and, <laughs> like, and, and dismissive because it does, you know, I think we each, we take away from these characters, what we relate to, and it might change week to week. I think we can see, we, we all have a different version, different yes. meanings. And it's, so important to understand why. I mean, if my child chooses like the evil stepmother or something like right. that to represent me, like I want to dig in and figure out like what's happening? Why? Where is that going? But I think like understanding why we might be giving the meanings 
that we're giving and do we want to consider a new meaning is that meaning serving us is it helping us be connected to ourselves and each other like that skill is just so important to cultivate for all of us yeah. Well, and reflecting on the transitional nature of it too, I think, because, you know, much like art therapy, it's not meant to be literally interpreted. It's meant to be, this is just a glimpse in time. So yes. this is today. Like maybe they're viewing you as dismissive today because you had an argument last night, but next week you may be a hero. And that's really our kids and us, you know, we too, as adults are constantly shifting our perspectives based on our day-to-day experiences. So we're a work in progress, always changing. I also think that's just going back to the core stories, that's another big shift is that, you know, we used to have these Grimm's fairy tales or, you know, these, these stories that are, have been told for eons, almost like folklore. And there's a clear villain in those. Mm -hmm. And one of, one of the things that the newer stories are doing that I know can be challenging for some people is that there is no clear villain, right? There's no person who is, ah, that one, that's the baddie and these yeah. people over here are good. We're having this nuance and these shades and even good characters are making mistakes and bad bad characters, the ones who lean bad are doing good things. It can feel confusing, um, mm-hmm. but really I think it's more reflective of reality. And I love that our, my kids are gonna see a lot more of that subtle nuance. I think you know one of the reasons we go to Mary Poppins a lot is because of Mr. Banks. He's fraught with all these these layers and he's just struggling <laughs> yeah. to be his best self and so so it was there that we saw a little bit more of those shades but you know a lot of a lot of the originals are very clear cut mm-hmm. yeah storylines and there's there's beauty in that simplicity too and that also can be helpful as a teaching tool but yeah. we're we're getting into far more interesting territory as far as I'm yeah. concerned with these newer iterations. That is, that is fascinating because I know, I mean, I remember as a kid being terrified of the Little Mermaid because of Ursula. Ursula is the scariest. <laughs> right. So, I mean, not only I think by kind of making these characters more nuanced, does it open movies up to kids who might be a little bit more fearful, but it also opens kids up to this idea that we are all more nuanced. And it's very rare that someone is a pure villain with all bad, no good. And that, you know, I think our kids need more opportunities to really sit with that experience of handling an individual that is both bad and good. And And, to know that about themselves too, right? Like we all have that within us. And if you are in such linear, you know, black and white, this, these are good, these are bad. When you make a mistake, which you Mm -hmm. know, we know our kids are going to make a mistake. What is their choice? Their choice is to then just think I'm bad and all the negative stuff that comes from that. I just am so happy we're giving our kids a more true picture of what humanity actually looks like which is we got it all in us we got the the we make mistakes and we have the potential for good yeah yeah and i'm thinking about encanto and the um the the magic which is both good and bad which i guess is kind of is that's kind of the villain do you feel that view that as the quote unquote villain in that story I don't know. <laughs> Jen and I Jen and I have interesting conversations around Encanto. Okay. <laughs> There's I mean each of the characters makes yeah. choices that lead to disconnection. That's one of the central themes that Lauren and I always explore. Disconnection with each other, with yourself, all of that. And if we're going to label that choices, actions that cause disconnection are bad Every one Mm -hmm. of those characters does that at some point in that movie. Um, But I think oftentimes the temptation, at least for me, is like, who am I connecting with and resonating with? And as you said, that can change. And who am I not? (laughs) That's the one that's the villain, whoever I'm not. And then that's something to explore and try to tease out. Like, oh, just because I'm not naturally connected to this person, I don't want to label them as Mm -hmm. the villain. Yeah, it's easier to take the perspective of someone who's similar to you. Yes. We're going to pause for a two-minute word from today's sponsors. The first sponsor is Fayerty. If you're looking for a great holiday gift for a partner or a friend or a family member, look no further. 
Faherty is passionate about craftsmanship, comfort, and sustainability. Every piece is designed to be a lifelong favorite. And if anything happens along the way, Faherty will replace or fix your clothes for life, no matter what. You can layer up this winter with their best-selling Legends sweater shirts for men, women, and kids. Or try out their recycled high-pile fleece jackets or their new frost sweaters. If you see me this winter, I'll be wearing one of their flannels. If you want to try it out, Faherty is giving Simple Families listeners an amazing deal. 20% off your order. So head to faherdybrand.com slash simple and use the code simple at checkout to get this deal. That's simple at Faherty, F-A-H-E-R-T-Y brand.com slash simple for 20% off. Faherdybrand.com slash simple. Our second sponsor for today is Seed. I don't know about you, but I've been long overwhelmed at the idea of choosing a probiotic. There are so many different strains and types. When my brain gets into this type of decision fatigue, often it just shuts down and I end up getting nothing, which is why I love that Seed has just one great solution. Seed's DS01 Daily Symbiotic is the real deal. It's a broad spectrum two-in-one probiotic and prebiotic. There are 24 strains formulated for digestion, gut immunity, and additional systemic benefits. What's unique about Seed is that they have a capsule-in-capsule design that protects against stomach acid, digestive enzymes, bile salts, for viability through digestion. Start a new healthy habit today. Visit seed.com forward slash simple and use the code simple to redeem 20% off your first month of Seed's DS01 Daily Symbiotic. That's seed.com forward slash simple and use the code simple. Thanks so much for supporting our sponsors. Back to our chat. So can we unpack this, this grandmother willow analogy a little bit? <laughs> I really, I'm curious about your thoughts on how Disney portrays parent child conflict. And, you know, a lot of times kind of circling in the grandparent as this savior, this like, don't do what your parents told you to do, follow your heart. And I don't know, is that something you guys have talked about on the podcast before? We, we have, we've explored it specifically with the grandmother from Moana. Okay. Um, I've, I've said that if I could pick one Disney character to have as like my life mentor, it would be uh -huh. the grandma from Moana. <laughs> um, Jen aspires to be the village crazy lady. I, do. <laughs> I, I already am in a, in a lot of people's eyes. I might as well just embrace it. Get the, get the, uh, the tattoo on my back. Right. <laughs> um, but I, I think that one of the reasons I don't know a lot of people who have that dynamic in their actual real life. I mean, I, I'm sure it yeah. exists, but not in my circles that, you know, the grandparents are, you know, like you said, like some kind of savior to the parent child conflict. I don't think mm -hmm. that happens that frequently, but I think if we instead think of it as like, see the long run as a parent is such a difficult thing. Like we're parenting to uh, so many times we're making parenting choices to get out the door on time. Like mm -hmm. what do I need to do to get them to do this today? But Disney uses the grandparent figure often, in my opinion, to be like, wait a minute, there's more than just your immediate needs that you need to be parenting toward. What's the long run thing here of what's the ultimate goal that you're raising this human being? And to me, Disney plays with that tension with parent and grandparent roles. But I think as parents, we're called to try to hold that tension ourselves, like to remember we're not just parenting to get everybody out the door on time. We're also parenting to raise a human being that helps contribute to the world. Yeah. So the grandparent is kind of like the zoomed out overview. I think of, so. What do you yeah. think, Lauren? This could lead to a very interesting conversation about <laughs> <laughs> parent-grandparent dynamics. But I think, you know, if grandparents are grounded, right, I, I think, and that's the thing about, I think, in Moana, the grandmother, is she seems to really see her son, right? And she's not trying to write wrongs necessarily that she made like it doesn't feel like she's making up for something so it feels like it comes from a really like grounded place her guidance and it seems like it really honors both moana and her father 
um, the, the advice that she gives that she's trying to really respectfully navigate that. Um, I will be honest. I haven't seen Pocahontas in maybe 20 years. So yeah, same. <laughs> I can't speak to grandmother Willow, but I'm curious to know what you would say today. You know, I haven't seen it in a very long time either. She watched it without me. So I'm like, I'm trying to recall. <laughs> she would go to visit. And then I know she brought John Smith there once. But Jen, do you have any recall yeah, of Grandma I, Willow? I think it's a similar dynamic to the grandmother in Moana. It's that she's trying to, she's zoomed out. She's like seeing a bigger yeah. story than the immediate story. And she's trying to help bring that into fruition in yeah. the role. Yeah, I'm trying to think of what other Disney movies have had a grandparent that plays that role. I feel like there probably are others. And yeah. by the way, my daughter doesn't have any dead grandmothers. So I think that <laughs> I should clarify that. I think that, no. that <laughs> that's even that was the reason more that this was so alarming to me when she said this. I'm like, well, wait a minute, your grandmothers are still alive. So I'm pretty sure unless it's a great grandmother or a great, great grandmother, I'm sure there's more to the story. <laughs> that's so funny. Oh my goodness. But the thought that like that is who comes to guide you or give you, yeah. like, I love that it probably didn't even mean you know we always have put our right. own meaning on what they're right. saying like to her yeah. it probably didn't even mean grandmother like in the way that yeah. we think of it yeah that's so funny though yeah. I was called to follow my own path by something greater than I but I do think ta talk a little bit more about parent-child conflict and you know your experience watching that as a parent, because I feel like we could spend a little more time as parents watching that conflict unfold and see ourselves in it and see how we may grow from observing that. So one of the things that I circle around all the time is this idea of we have our values, which are like the things that are the most important to us. And then we have our strategies, which are the things and the ways that we live out our values. And so when I'm encountering conflict, we've talked about this in, with regard to actually Moana and her dad, with regard to Triton and um, Ariel, like it comes up a lot in Disney as well, but we for sure see it that it's like, trying to understand what is the thing this person cares about and parse that out from the way they're caring about it, right? Like they, this is the thing that's important to them and this is the way they're trying to get connection with that thing that's important to them. So that's the value and the strategy and trying to navigate where we have shared values but differing strategies and where <laughs> our values might like, not be this, not be in alignment and knowing what you're talking about. So my kids are getting, I'm like fully in the teen to my, my daughter just turned 13 this year. So as our conversations evolve, like something that she's prioritizing, like wants to go to a sleepover, for example, but it's conflicting with a family time. So she's prioritizing a connection is really important to her, but her strategy for connection right now, as it should be, is friends. And connection is important to me and I want connection with each other. And like having a conversation where we can say, I see that this is really important for you and that this is the way that you're doing it or the way that you're prioritizing it, the way that you're wanting to experience this thing that's important to you. To me, it's the most helpful way to get to not necessarily like everyone's happy in agreement, but to see each other in the conflict and to see ourselves and then to see each other. And I try when I know I'm heading in, sometimes, of course, these conflicts pop up out of the blue and totally blindside me and then I fail epically at this. <laughs> yeah. But if I know we're we're approaching a difficult conversation, I try to go into it like what's important to me, what's important to her, how am I living that out? How are they living it out? Like trying to get clarity around those things is so important for maintaining connection in the midst of conflict. 
And I have littler ones. So I have three and five. And so we're, we're navigating things like tantrums and, you know, that sort of thing. And like my daughter in particular right now is going to like these extremes, right? Like I will never be loved. I'm (laughs) never doing that. Or you will always, you know, there's, there's no middle ground. You are the worst mom in the world. Yeah. I haven't gotten that one yet. I (laughs) have been told that I am ruining her life. (laughs) Okay, um, which I was like, <laughs> wow, that didn't take long. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really good at this job. Um, but I I feel like those tricky moments and it, Jen and I talk about getting out the door. Why is why is the front door such a just awful place? <laughs> I don't it's know. There's so something terrible. about the energy swirling there. But uh-huh. in the moments where I can take time, to build the scaffolding so that when she's older, we can have those conversations that Jen is stepping into with her older kids. This is another beautiful thing about being Jen's friend and having kids that are a little younger so that I get to like follow along and pick up all these little nuggets. (laughs) But um, that is something that to me, like when I do have those tough moments and I can start to like verbalize what they're thinking and say, am I getting that right? Even if they can't fully engage in it, you know, they may later be able to pick up that language more easily. And so just mm-hmm. trying to think about that in those mo- those more stressful moments. And as Jen said, really maintain connection. Don't always do it perfectly. There's a lot of, you know, external pressures that can impact how we're showing up as parents. But even for the little ones, not not saying like down the line, I can deal with this, right? Because Jen and I talk about how we're parenting for our adult relationship with our kids, right? Once they're adults, because hopefully the majority of our relationship with them will be when they are grown and out of our house. So how do we set the foundation to really make that transition go smoothly, but again, age appropriate now with an eye to the future and what we want once they're grown and and out, out of our homes? Yeah. I love the idea of incorporating Disney because I think so many of our kids get really attached to the stories and the characters and they watch the movies over and over and they know them backwards and forwards and, you know, they go watch them on ice and they watch them on Broadway and there's just so many different iterations. Yeah. Um, I love that. And it's, you know, I, I have to admit, I feel like I would be, I would be a fraud if I did admit this to you, but I actually don't really like Disney very much. <laughs> <laughs> so, awesome. and, and I was, so when I was preparing for this interview, I was kind of un- unpacking that a little bit because I told my podcast manager, I'm like, well, cause she's a big Disney fan. And I said, it was like, you know, but I don't really like Disney very much. And she's like, just listen to the podcast. Just listen. I like, okay. Okay. So then I listened. I'm like, I actually really love this. So you actually have, <laughs> have helped me to pivot my mindset and actually unpack a little bit of the fact that it's not actually Disney that I don't like it's Disney world and like the crowds and the chaos. And like, that's just not my thing. That's not my vacation. So I don't think it's Disney that I don't like. So now I'm like, I'm rethinking my whole relationship with Disney. You're, you're looking at the meaning that you (laughs) right. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Go in, (laughs) go in that layer deeper. It's, you know, it's such an exercise that we all all need to partake in sometimes yes. in various aspects of our lives. But if you want two gals to show you how to do Disney World right, <laughs> got them right it's, here. It's literally like two miles that way. So really, I know, I know how to do it. And my husband okay. works at Disney, but I, I don't, could take all the things on- you just said you don't like, I'm right there with you. I cannot handle <laughs> right. any of that. And when people come with me to Disney, they're like, oh my gosh, this is a totally different experience because I know how to work the system. Work the lines. Yeah. And that's Uh, the important part, right? Making um, it smooth and peaceful. And I, the last time I went, we just went for a day and we were elbow to elbow with other people. And it was just those days. It wasn't fun. fun. You know, three hours in line for Peter Pan. And it just did that. I, you know, my kids were three and five, I think when we, we did that. And, um, yeah, it just wasn't, it wasn't. You're not idea. broken, fun. but you thought that was okay. not fun. Yes. <laughs> okay. That's, that's that, not I, fun. Even for the people who love Disney, yes, that part right. is not fun. <laughs> I've looked at Lauren in the middle of a crowd for fireworks and been like, I don't think this is worth this. <laughs> right. <laughs> I want to leave. I can watch from the beach across the lagoon and have plenty right. of arm space around. <laughs> totally. Yeah. So finding what works for you, what works with your family and being willing to to shift your mindset on it. Yes, absolutely. 
Well, thank you so much for sharing today and for chatting with me about this. Tell me a little bit about where to find your podcast, um, where to find you online, how to get in touch. So I think the the best place to come is our website. So it's magicalmindsetmoments.com. There's links there. Anywhere you listen to podcasts, you'll be able to find us. Um, we're also on Instagram. And so with every episode, we give a conversation starter or a journal prompt. You can use it however you like around the kitchen table or on your own or coffee with a friend. And so we post that to Instagram uh, and we love to hear back what people are getting from the show. So come on over, share, share your thoughts, take a listen. And we, we would love to hear from you. Thank you so, so much for both of you being here today. Thank you. For so grateful us. for the opportunity. Thank you. Thanks so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed my chat with Jen and Lauren. If you want to get more information about them and get in touch with them and the things that we talked about today, go to simplefamilies.com forward slash episode 333. I appreciate you being here. Have a good one.